birthdays or anniversaries? Oh, Mr. Phil. Come up, Dennis. I'll quit faking you out. Good morning, everyone. Got to make sure the mic's on whenever you met him. You know, you're just talking loud. <laughs> All right, announcements. We're going to have children's church students that are going to do what? Live. 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 What you going to do? You're going to go over here, right? Sit down, right? Who's your teacher? Oh, close. Daryl. Daryl, just, I, I'm, I'm coming up here shortly. All right, Annie, we're going to we'll start collecting the Annie Armstrong North American Mission offering. And then we're going to have play practice after morning services. We're going to have the all-invited fellowship meal Wednesday the 13th at 6 to 6.30. We're going to have youth, children, and adult Bible studies at 7. Now, the 17th, play practice on the 17th is a full-out dress rehearsal. Duncan. <laughs> Be there, huh? Yeah. Okay, and... Um, we're going to have Easter program is going to be on the 24th. Good Friday service is going to be at, on Friday. That makes sense. Uh, the 29th at 6 p.m. And Brian is going to be preaching the Easter sunrise service at 7 a.m. at Pawnee Bills. I think they talk all new pastors in doing that first year. Ah, oh, there you go. You didn't tell me about that. Man, dang it. All right, we're going to have... After Easter service, here we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for the kids. Yeah. And then uh, we'll have fish Sunday potluck lunch afterwards. So we'll kick the kids out, let them go, fi go find the eggs, and we'll eat before they get back. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and uh, Wednesday before Easter, we're going to stuff the eggs. Yeah, that's a good day. Uh, adults get to eat all the stuff that don't fit in eggs. Yeah. All right, anybody got anything else to announce, to say, talk about? Oh, yeah, well, if you want to donate some candy to the Easter egg hunt, we got a tote back there by the door. Bring it. we got to be a little fit in the maze now, or we're going to eat way too much. Well, just imagine mash them away, ain't it? It's <laughs> a mash them away, yeah. Don't worry about it. We're going to stuff them eggs. <laughs> yeah, because I ain't got to live with none of them kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm a full-out uncle. I get them all jacked up and send them home. Say, hey, this kid's broke. Fix it. Okay. Anything else? Uh, yeah. Who does the T1. It's supposed to go out 9 to 4 to 6. Woo! Um, I'm supposed to go out Thursday, but I'm supposed to go out Friday, but I'm afraid everybody's calling me after 9 and because they're scared that the pastor's going to report me. Now, what, what about this? What about this cable? About what? The cable. So we, we are providing... Um, When's that going to be available? It, it's already up and running. I guess Not at my house. I think we've got 500 in Fairfax. Uh, yeah. They're trying to get it within the next uh, five weeks. 
Ah. No, I was talking about five days. <laughs> well, I know a dude, don't just. <laughs> we'll, we'll splice, man. It's cool. <laughs> All right. Anybody got anything else they want to talk about? But man, they do a bang up job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when you got a somebody. Rec yeah. Last time we we had power go out, they had mom back. Mom needs a power lift. It don't work with power, out. and they had her back in an hour. It was great. They're fantastic people. No kidding. Appreciate it, Duncan. All right. What else we want to talk about? Okay, I guess we're done. All right, let's 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 meet one another. Greet something.
All right. All right. It's good to hear the little rumbling of everybody talking, you know. We do like each other here at Masham. One thing about it, you, you can find somebody that will welcome you here. Everybody, we're going to turn to page 192 if you want to use your hymnal. Otherwise, the words are going to be on the screen soon and very soon. the other day if she could pray and so this morning she's going to pray for us Lord please help um, the people out there that need help please bless us and nurture our bodies in this world please help us go guide us safely home today in Jesus name amen Page 438. It blesses my heart that little kids want to participate in the service. 438. Heaven came down.
standing good. When the roll is called up yonder, page 516. <clears throat> when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair Before everybody sees, uh, I'm going to ask one thing. All the women that went to the women's retreat yesterday, please stand. We had a wonderful turnout from our church. Stand up. They, we had wonderful. Thank you for doing that. I want to thank you all for going. I know that we... Dear Lord, we thank you for the blessings you've given us. Thank you for this wonderful day that we have to come together to, to worship and learn more about you. As you bless this service, that it will go to honor you and bless this offering that will go to further your kingdom and do your work. Help us to just keep learning and fellowshipping together in this church. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Come on down, have a seat. We're going to do something. I'm going to. Good to see you. Miss Amy is not feeling good this morning. So you need to pray for Miss Amy, don't we? Why don't we do that right quick, okay? Dear Lord, we ask that you. Uh, we will, first of all, we want to thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Thank you for each one of these kids that are here today, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you please help Miss Amy. She's not feeling good. She's had a lot of stuff that's happened at the library, but the allergies are all so bothering her. Lord, bring her back next week, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Miss Robin's going to do a little lesson that's a little different. Okay? I need your help. Okay? All of you, including the audience. Okay? I'm going to talk about the fact that we're supposed to build our house, our heart, on who? God. Jesus. We need to build our, heart, our hearts on Jesus, okay? Now, we're going to take a story that you know and talk about building our houses wrong and who builds them right, okay? We're going to go with the story of, as, as John is taught, the three little pigs, Three little pigs built their house first at what? Straw, wood, and then a brick. I know, I know you know the story, but just a minute. You're going to have to help me in a minute, okay? We're going to say that the straw, shh, pay attention. The, the straw the person doesn't go to church and doesn't pay attention, doesn't know about Jesus. And Satan comes and he's going to do what to his house? What is he doing? He wants to, he's going to huff and puff and blow the house down. And what does the little pig in the house say? Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Okay, people, you got it. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Okay. The Satan comes and knocks on the door of the house that made of straw where the person doesn't go to church and the little pig says, What? Not by the hair. And he huffs and he puffs and he blows the house down, right? Then there's the person who plays going to church but really doesn't build their house on Jesus at all. And that's the house of wood. They know some about Jesus, but they just won't let Jesus into their heart. And uh, Satan comes knocking on the door. Knock, knock, knock. And he goes, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. And what does the little pig in the house say? Boy, no wonder he blew the house down. Uh, and he blows the house down. And now he goes to the house that's built on Jesus. And he knocks on the door. And it is that going to be your house? Yeah. Okay, you're building your house on Jesus, right? And Satan comes and knocks on that door. And he says, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. What are you going to say? Not by the hands of my chin, chin, Louder. Not by the hands of my And he huffs and he puffs, and does he blow the house down? No. no. Because, he ha because who's living in the heart? Jesus. Okay. Now, Tyson, would you lead us in prayer today? Would you want to? If you don't want to, I'll do it. Okay, I'm going to do it this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for being our Lord and Savior, Lord. Lord, let it be that it, everybody knows that if Satan were to come and blow on our house, that we would not, our house would not fall down because we have who living in our hearts? Jesus. Lord, we ask that you just guide and direct the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
go. Now it's on. Right? Now we're on. When I was asked to do the special this morning, I kept thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And this song just kept playing in my heart. I, I don't know why. I, we look around and we see, like Jeff and Anna, we see so many people that we love, that we know serves the Lord, and they do the things they're supposed to do, but yet think bad things happen to them. This were promised that it was going to be sunshine and roses all the time. But we do know that God has a way of making everything right. The man that wrote this song, he, he was a perfect example of that, Horatio Spat. He grew up in the time he was like a wealthy lawyer in 1870, about the time of the Chicago fires. He had four daughters and he had one son. His son died before he was four from scarlet fever. And when the Chicago fire hit, it burned everything down, all of his businesses and everything. It was a really bad time for his whole family financially. So he decided a trip to England would do him really well. So they got ready to go, and then because of some kind of a financial problem, he couldn't go with them. But his wife and his daughters made this trip. Halfway there, another ship ran into him, busted the ship in half, and all four of his daughters were, par were killed in the in the shipwreck. So when his wife got to the first place to telegraph, she sent him a message and said, saved alone, what do I do now? You know, and I mean, it, it's just heart-wrenching to think. Then the first thing he did was catch the ship to England, and halfway there, the captain showed him where, his, where the ship went down and all of his daughters died, and he spent a lot of time on that deck, and he's the one that composed these lyrics. So, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of bad things sometimes do happen to good people. But we know in Jeremiah 29, God tells us, I want to read this verse. It means a lot to me. Read it here. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear you. And I know he hears us even in our trials. <laughs> Like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say It is well it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet. Though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul the sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. 
it is well, it is well with my soul. And the Lord haste the day when the thing shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back like a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well. With my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Go ahead and open your Bibles. Oh, sorry, I got to do the thing. Can you hear me, Jerry? You can hear me? Perfect. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You know, funny enough, my first ever sermon was in the book of John, but I told that story of uh, how that song, It Is Well, was written, and I was just asking Michael if he had heard it, and he said no, and Shelley saved me the trouble of howling and telling him the story. So, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Right, Shelley? All right. So, for those who are new here, or for those who may not be familiar, I like to preach what is called expository preaching, right? Basically, we go through books of the Bible, and we just preach what the text says. This does a few things. Number one, it makes me preach about things I would prefer sometimes not to, uh, some unpopular topics, other things... um, One of the big marks of expository preaching is the tone of the passage sets the tone of the sermon. So last week, very encouraging sermon, right? Everybody had a good time last week, I think. Next, The next time we're in 1 John, we're going to talk about end times and the Antichrist. That's kind of exciting. But this week, specifically, this is a bit of a, a hard sermon, a bit of a toe stomper near the beginning. So, But just know I'm not picking at you. John is picking on you, so don't be mad at me, be mad at at John. So if your body is able and your spirit is willing, please stand for the reading of God's Word. This is 1 John 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for allowing us to come together to worship you. I thank you for the freedom we have to worship, Lord, that we do not have to do so under fear of persecution, but that we can come openly with our brothers and sisters to study your word, to sing songs of worship to you, Lord. I want to lift up Jeff and and Maverick again, that you've just continued to be with them this morning and strengthen them and to heal Maverick, Lord. Pray that you would just help us to, to hear your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So for those of you who have me on Facebook, and if you don't, you really miss some good quotes sometimes, I tell you, but uh, just the other day I posted a quote from Jonathan Edwards, and this is one of those things, I didn't go looking for this quote, uh, it was sent to me from a pastor friend of mine just randomly in, in, a, in a text, and here's the quote, it says, if vain spending of time, idleness, envy, strife, variance, emulations, and I don't know what that means, so don't ask me. Wrath, pride, worldliness, selfishness are marks of Christians we have among us in abundance. So this is from John Owen from The Mortification of Sin. 
And to quote another pastor of mine, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. So John Owen, he's the same man that is famous for the quote, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Um, He took sin very seriously. You know, we live in a day and age where people take sin very lightly. I mean, they, they laugh at sin, they encourage sin. Sin is no big deal to our culture at large. So Owen's point from both of these quotes was that the devil is not the only enemy of us Christians. Our own sin and the way we spend our time, energy, and resources should put us on watch. So our passage this week is aimed at those same Christians that John wrote to last week, those same group of Christians that John encouraged beautifully in that pastoral prayer last week. This passage is not geared toward those Christians from chapter 1 that were claiming not to have the truth or that were claiming not to have sin. This is a warning passage to those who are walking in faith. And to quote Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. And we should be like the bridegrooms from the parable of the bridegroom, always on watch, always waiting for Jesus to come back. That way we don't fall asleep and our candles go out, and when the bride or when the groom finally comes, we find ourselves locked out of the wedding feast. So the main idea of the text this morning is this. We can only serve one master in this life, God or the world. John writes, do not love the world or the things in the world. So this little section of scripture is one that has concerned me, weighed heavily on me for many, many years, ever since I remember reading it when I was probably a teenager. And it concerned me for one very specific reason, and I tended to kind of pretend like it didn't exist. And the reason for that is I thought it was taking, or it was telling me that all of these things that I enjoy doing, I needed to stop doing them. Like, we need to get rid of the TV, we need to burn all of our fictional books, we need to just do nothing but read God's Word and go to the Bible. And that concerned me because I was like, I kind of like some of the things that I do, right? Like, I don't want to give up those things. And yet, so here, again, when you preach verse by verse through the Bible, you have to run into these things, and you study them, and you try to come to terms with them, and you think, so what is John getting at here? So for those of you who do not know this, or do not know me very well, I love video games. I'm a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a gamer, less than I used to be, uh, but I don't just love any video games. I specifically love games like World of Warcraft, right? This tie clip I'm always wearing is from World of Warcraft. That's how much I like it. I mean, I've been playing WoW, is the short version, for over half of my life. Uh, I take breaks all the time, but one of my, one of my concerns was, this has been a part of my life for so long, I don't want to give it up. And maybe you hate video games, maybe you think they're childish, and I would say, well, you're wrong. <laughs> but, I mean, how many of us here have known diehard sports fans? I mean, some of these sports fans, they can tell you the most obscure sports statistics from the last hundred years without batting an eye, like it's the most normal thing that you've ever run into in your life. And maybe you don't like sports. Maybe you think entertainment is evil. Well, again, you'd be wrong. (laughs) But how much time have you spent in a deer blind, on a boat, reading books, watching TV? It's all pretty much the same thing. And so when we look at a passage like this, we ask, is John teaching that we have to give up these things? Because if so, I'm going to know a lot of bored people in their life right? So all of us here, we probably have some hobby, some form of entertainment that we like to partake in, and all of these things are also enjoyed by the world at large. So are we give up these things completely? I think John has something else in mind. So when John uses the word world, he uses it in three senses, in the gospel and in these books. He uses the word world sometimes like we do to refer to planet Earth. He 
He sometimes uses the word world to refer to people. We see this in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Uh, He wasn't talking about the earth there necessarily. He was talking about sinners like you and I. The third sense, and the sense that is in mind here when John uses the word world, is the intentional system of rebellion against our God. So, in essence, John is saying, do not love this rebellious world system that hates God. And it should be obvious why that is. If we take a look at the world and the things the world produces... Uh, It's pretty easy to see why we should hate the world. I mean, some of the things they push down our throats, and not just our throats, but the throats of our children and children's cartoons are concerning, to say the least. I mean, just the other day, I was having a conversation with another parent about children's cartoons. You'll have these long-standing cartoons that have been going on for 20, 30 years. They've always been fine but they'll get a new writer, a new producer, or something like that, and then all of a sudden you'll have this new character come in talking about their two moms or their two dads. I mean, they are are shoving this worldliness down our children's throat, and it should concern us, especially because we have a lot of Christians that aren't concerned about it. Uh, They just let their children watch whatever they want. They themselves watch whatever they want. And so we must be watchful not to love these systems, these rebellious world systems. I defined love for you a few few weeks ago as this. Love is an intentional choice of the will to sacrifice our wants, desires, and sometimes needs in order to care for someone else. When John is telling us not to love the world, he has something like that definition of love in mind. Making intentional choices to sacrifice what's good for us in order to better concern ourselves with worldly things. So we have to ask, what are some telltale signs of loving the world? First, when the world or any object in the world occupies so much of our thoughts that it excludes any serious thinking or reflection on God or His Word, you are loving the world. Second, when things of the world engross most or all of our conversations, we're loving the world. Third, if we are unwilling to part with something when need be or to give it up for God's purposes, then you are loving the world. Fourth, if we are not content with the portion of goods that the Lord has deemed fit to bless us with, This proclaims a criminal love for worldly goods. If we secretly grieve that we are not as well off as our neighbors, then we are loving the world. Fifth, when we pursue other things, worldly things, with a greater zeal, that can be understood, a greater energy, passion, and enjoy them more than we do serving God and enjoying His favor, then we are loving the world. Sixth, If we pride ourselves in earthly distinctions, if we expect to be treated with a higher regard, or if we resent those that have less than we ourselves have, we are loving the world. And seventh, when we seek to acquire to keep worldly objects in a wrong or sinful manner by unwarranted means, we are loving the world. So, I like to spend, I spend a fair bit of time on what's called Reddit. It is an internet forum, and the main thing, one of the big things I like to do on Reddit is if I'm, you've probably seen this, you can't trust Amazon reviews anymore, right? If you go to Amazon and you look at a review, they'll all say it's fine, and you'll get it in, and it's, it's a piece of junk. And so, I'll search something on Reddit, hey, and then you'll have a hundred different people giving you their honest opinion And so that was one of the big reasons I went on Reddit. But Reddit does this thing, like all social media does, it shows you things that you're not looking for. And one of the popular posts that it always shows me is, am I the jerk for doing X, Y, or Z? And one common thread that I see all the time on Reddit, I mean, I woke up, saw it twice yesterday morning, was you have have posts like this. 
Am I, the, am I in the wrong for being upset with my spouse for asking for an open marriage? And, and thankfully, Reddit is very liberal, but they even have the good sense to think that open marriages are offensive. Yet, no, you're not wrong for being upset by that. That's absurd. I think everyone here would be very upset if your spouse asked you for an open marriage. Like, that's my bride, that's my treasure that God has blessed me with. I mean, how dare these people come at this? And you may be wondering, why am I talking about this? That's kind of an obscene thing to talk about at church. But here's the deal. So when we're Christians, as Christians, we're in a relationship with God. And you know what we do with our relationship with God? When we try to love the world, yet we come to church every Sunday... We open our relationship with God. We are in an open marriage with God when we come to church, and yet we parade around like the world does. And John is saying here, we can't do that, church. We make mistakes, yes. We all make mistakes more than we want to, more than we like. We constantly fight against our sin nature, and then we do not do the good things that we want to do. And there's teaching that's been around as long as the Bible has been around. It's, well, shouldn't we spend more so that grace can be shown more in our lives? Paul tells us in the book of Romans, he builds it out. By no means, God forbid it. There is mercy and grace in God. God will forgive you for all of your sins if you are a Christian. But a telltale sign, a true, honest mark of a Christian,
that so loved us that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you and I. Not so that we can abuse.